Thank you very much. And thanks for attending everyone today. So um, what I failed to put in that uh, bio is that since I left practice on a day-to-day -day basis, I work with practice teams all over the United States, sometimes in the UK and sometimes in Canada. And I'll visit with them and I try to help refocus, repoint their teams towards their mission statement and get them back to taking care of clients and patients. And so I've visited dozens and dozens and dozens of practices. I've, if you've heard me speak before, you know that I, I, I never really believed that the way that we did business was that efficient. And now when we've sort of, um, we've tricked out that typical workflow to accommodate for the safety precautions that we need to have in place for COVID, I think it's really driving a lot of teams to be physically exhausted and mentally exhausted. And while I'm used to hearing my share of veterinary teams complain, I believe these complaints are, are true and they're sincere. And we are facing staff shortages, burnout at our practice, and we're moving into a fall where we may have a deepening of the recession, where we may have a resurgence of the virus, and it's already going to tax our teams. So, I wanted to talk today about some of the changes that we could put in place to mitigate uh, the, the kind of agony that, and pain that we're feeling on a day-to-day -day basis. But I really, and I don't think I'm Pollyanna-ing this or Paula Andying this, I do have a rather optimistic view of the future. Because I, while I think that there are a number of bad things or hurdles in our way to move forward, I also think that there are a number of things that are coming together that really play into our hands and can help us not just eliminate, you know, not just get through COVID in the short term, but really a lot, a, eliminate these chronic concerns in the long term and reseat us in a position of competitiveness and happiness with our work. So uh, today what we're going to cover is I'm going to you know, take a little more time to talk about the major concerns that I think we're experiencing as we move into the fall. And then I'd like to make some changes, uh, recommend, recommendations to you about changes in our workflow and additional adaptations that I think are going to be important. I want to thank CC Health for sponsoring uh, this today. It's been a wonderful partnership with them. I had a great chance to speak directly to pet owners yesterday, and I had such a good time on that call, and I'm so appreciative for uh, CC to provide that uh, for our clients. I wanted to remind all of you that this program is race approved. So just make sure, I'm pretty sure that this is already done, but we have your first name and your last name and a valid email address and we'll get those certificates out into the mail to you very shortly after the program. I also wanted to let you know that there is a number of resources available to you for this program. So they're embedded in QR codes. So if you've got that cell phone handy, now's the time to fiddle fiddle through it and try to find that uh, QR scanner in it. And at various times during the pre presentation, I'll have a QR code up and you can scan that code and that will take you directly to the resource. And I really tried to source out some stuff that I felt was non-biased and really directly uh, discussed some, you know, on a lot, expanded on some of the topics that I'm gonna briefly talk about today. Um, you can also go to bashhallow.com where all of these resources exist and um, many links to external uh, resources. So let's jump right into what's ahead for uh, the ongoing COVID concerns. There's economic downturn. There are these persistent chronic staff shortages. And I think the days of us hoping that one day it's gonna go away or suddenly there's gonna, there are gonna be new applicants available are over. We have to come up with new ways to manage these chronic staff shortages. I wanna talk about a different client I want to talk about the cold weather that's about to come up and probably you know, talk about how we're, we need to move, in, move our care indoors. So let's talk about the economic forecast. This is Kristalina uh, Georgieva. If you haven't heard her speak, she's the Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund. So you can go directly to that website. There's the QR code for that. Sorry, Georgina, that, I mean, Kristalina, that I blocked her face there. <laughs> but that's the QR code that you can go to. She's really smart. She's really level-headed. She's an excellent communicator. She acknowledges that they were, you know, perhaps they painted too stark of a future. You know, at the, at the beginning of this pandemic, they were really talking about sort of dramatic uh, levels of recession. And in more advanced economies like the US and Europe, we didn't experience that. But she really cautions, and I think there's, I, I don't think that it's, it's hype where she's being 
um, hysterical about this. She cautions that we're not out of the woods yet. She talks about there are a lot of countries in the world that were already on the edge in terms of their economics, and this pandemic is pushing them near the very edge of the cliff. And she cautions that if they go, fall off, they, the repercussions of that may be systemic and the whole world may uh, fall into recession. It, there was a report that came out in June by the World Bank, and they predicted a contraction in the US economy by 5%. That has turned out to be true. And that same recession, and she acknowledges this too, and this was her uh, uh, address was to the London School of Economics. It just was released, I think, on October 6th. She acknowledges too that both the uh, uh, World Bank and, and the International Monetary Fund predict that if, the, if we have a resurgence, that that contraction could even get up to historic levels of 8%. Uh, they, they also warn of ongoing scarring, permanent scarring that will happen to citizens because of bankruptcies and loss of jobs and the impact that this is having on children's education. You can also take a look at the downturn regionally. So I live part-time in New York. I live part-time up here in beautiful Northeastern Pennsylvania. And I can tell that these two areas are experiencing the recession very differently. The Brookings Institute took a look at the industries most likely to be impacted, immediately impacted by the shutdown. And then they mapped out where those workers lived in the United States. So that's this map. It's uh, the brookingsinstitute.edu, I believe is the URL. But again, the uh, QR code is coming up for it. If you find your veterinary practice underneath one of those little hot bubbles, you may, your area may be experienced experiencing the impact of the recession more so than other parts of the country where those high risk industries and those employees do not live. I want to talk about the chronic staff shortages that all of us have been experiencing. And I'd like to make a case for us to try to take advantage of this higher levels of unemployment. Now, I know that all of you are extremely busy at your practice and you're may maybe saying that, Hallow, we don't have time to look through all those applicants and I feel you. So I want to give you two ideas. You know, if you, um, sorry, if you, if, if you are, um, uh, uh, like me, when you put an ad out in Indeed, your box is getting filled up with potential uh, you know, client care representatives or veterinary assistants or kennel workers, not technicians or doctors, but it's loading up with that. And it's very tedious for you to have to go through all of that, uh, 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 that list of applicants. I'm gonna teach you how to do that a little bit better. But I first wanna make a case for saying I love you by saying no. One of the mistakes that we're regularly making in our practice is we're constantly saying yes to clients. Yes, yes, yes. We see an ain't doing right patient uh, that, we're, that blindsides us in our schedule and we decide to work it up right then and there. Every, every day I'm hearing practice teams complain of the fact that they're way too busy. And yet, you know, from my perspective, you guys are controlling the throttle. And when practice owners and practice managers are regularly making a decision to say yes to clients, you're passively saying no to your employees. No, I don't really care about you. I don't care how many lunches you're offering them. I don't care how many you know, uh, reward things that you're putting in the reward jar or whatever. When you're constantly saying yes, yes, yes to clients, you're passively saying no, no, no to your team members and it's ruining morale. And m many of you know that, that you can buy your way to happiness through buying your team members more lunch. I want you to learn to say, I love you to your clients by saying no. Mr. Hallow, Rye is pretty sick. I'm gonna send you home with some medication today to mitigate those symptoms, but I need to see Rye tomorrow. But no, I want you to see Rye No, Mr. Hallow, in order for us to do this right, to do the right thing by Rye and to work this up properly, she needs to come in tomorrow. I think there's a way to say no to clients, which lets them know that in order for me to provide the care that I need to provide, I have to say no right now. It doesn't mean I don't love you. Remember that. Remember that you don't have to fall over backwards to clients. You can take control of the wheel and still enjoy the, the fact that they know that you care about them. I want you to don't think that you can hire your way out of these work, these, uh, work inefficiency issues. Stop thinking big and I want you to think gig. Many of the reasons why I think our team members are overstretched and demoralized about that 
is because their focus is not on the things that really fulfill them, which is patient and client care. They're constantly being dragged away to these side jobs that we have, and then we remain constantly frustrated that these jobs don't get done. Do yourself a favor. There's already a precedent put in place to, for people to work for home and this gig economy. Farm that Facebook and social media stuff out. Farm out your IT stuff. Don't stick it on your team members. When you farm out these individual jobs, everybody on board, you and that other party, have a clear expectation of what needs to get done and when it needs to get done. You understand the value of the job and you understand how much you should pay for that job. You will do your team a great service and you will open yourself up to a wider uh, uh, amount of people that you could possibly employ. And now I'd like to talk to you about streamlining the hiring process. So when we put an ad in Indeed, the first thing that we do to help us streamline the hiring process is that, you know how some people will always add that cover letter that their English teacher told them to add. We don't ask them to do that. At the very bottom of that, you know, terrific ad that says like, we're the best hospital in the whole wide world to work at that you've already, I know you guys are already writing because I read your ads. But the last thing I want you to say is, so do us a favor. We get so many applicants for uh, this position because we're such a great place to work at. Why don't you do me a favor and write just a couple of sentences in that little opening cover letter portion of Indeed about why you should get the job. So we just, we don't ask for a big long cover letter that they're gonna add as attachment. They have to write in that opening portion, that opening window, a couple of sentences. That's wonderful for me because as I'm going through these applicants, I don't have to open anything up. They've either done that task or they've not done that task. And surprisingly, I'm sure you've already figured this out, only 25% of the applicants will have done that task. And that's wonderful for me because I can just eliminate all those 75% of the people that can't even read and take direction from the outset of this interview. I don't just dump them and put them into, uh, you know, into the oblivion. I, I, we have a lovely form letter that goes out to them and regrets them because remember that these people are potential clients moving forward and potentially, who knows, maybe they'll change their ways and they could be a better employee. So let's say that they filled out that cover letter. Okay, great. They did that. I like what they wrote. It's, it, it's grammatical. It, it, it's sincere. So now I can start opening up the application. I don't spend a lot of time looking at this thing. I either get a warm and fuzzy or I don't. If I get a warm and fuzzy, I send them this thing. This is a form that's built on our WordPress website. If you don't have a WordPress website, you can just Google, is my website WordPress? <laughs> you can put your URL and it'll be like, yes, you got a WordPress website, or no, you don't have a WordPress website. But if you do have a WordPress website, you probably have a form thing and you can build this, or if you can't build it, your 12-year-old can build it. It's that easy. So this form goes out to them and says, congratulations, you're taking, you know, you, you've achieved the next level, we're interested in you, and now we're gonna take your application to the next level, fill this stuff out. So here's the part where they fill out all the, you know, information that we need just for bookkeeping purposes. And then the next, uh, 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 the next clip is about um, uh, all, the, all the make or breaks, you know, we're open these hours, we're open these days, can you or can you not work? If they say no, then immediately when this thing comes back, if it comes back, I can eliminate them, send them a regret letter, and I'm done. We also have a space on here for them to add any, I'm sorry that this keeps going back like this. There we go. Um, we have an opportunity here to add their resume to that, so all of their application materials live in one spot, on the website. And then lastly, and most importantly, don't know why that's doing that. You might have to take my word for it. There we go. Uh, 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 lastly, and most importantly on this slide is where we're asking them questions about their, um, about our mission statement. So we've, so we've looked at our mission statement, we've asked ourselves what is most important uh, for us in our employees, and then we ask them questions about that. And these essay questions are really great at helping suss out whether or not this person's you know, ethos might be a match for our ethos. And you know, up to this point, you know, if you remember, we've asked them to the cover letter, then we've sent this form out to them, only 25% of them will actually fill out the form. And of that 25%, only maybe three or four of them will actually be readable and enjoyable to read. But when you do read them, when you do get that one, it's like, wow, man, can't wait to meet this candidate. And now we only have about three to four, maybe five people out of 100, literally, for us to reach out to. 
And, but you'll be excited about reaching out to them. You won't be like, yeah, what's your name, bub? I mean, you'll be really happy about it. And I think it changes the dynamic of the interview and gives them more of an opportunity to be successful in it. So this has been incredibly helpful for us to automate and streamline the hiring process. And I have to tell you, I think we're damn good at this right now. Typically, if clients ask us to do this for them, I would say we have like a 90 to 95% success rate with them liking the candidates that we send over. 95, I'll even say 95%, it's really good. I'm so sorry that this keeps flipping like this. Hopefully I won't have to stop this show. Okay, there we go. Now I'd like to talk about a different client. So, um, you know, up to this point, we've been siloing our clients in like their, their, you know, their millennials or their Gen Xs or their Gen Ys or whatever. And I always sort of felt like it was astrology with an MBA. But, you know, I don't think any of us can deny right now that all of us have undergone a sort of sea change in our lives. I'm, I'm not just, I, I don't think that's hype. I think all of us have changed a great deal due to what's been thrown at us over the past couple of months. We're all online more. We are more holistic and health conscious. We are, I think, likely to be if we're not already cash strapped. We're busy, we're mobile, we're virtual, we're socially conscious, and we've had a telemedicine experience. Now, I have data on all of this. I don't have time to insert it in today's lecture, but I promise you that this is an emerging profile of what all of our clients are, irrespective of gender, race, um, or age. And so I'd like you to think about this profile as you move forward with solutions that will not just help the problems that you are having, but also position you to a more competitive spot and a spot that, isn't, um, that, that doesn't require us to work so hard to get there. So I'd, um, I'd, just to sort of underline how, um, how much of a concern clients having less money to pay for services is, I wanna share this Vitus Vet field study that's currently out there now. Not, so not all the results are, have come in, but these are the, the preliminary results of a field study that's currently out. And I think about a thousand practices have the opportunity to answer this field uh, survey. So that includes 24% of clients ask about additional payment options daily. 24% of veterinary practice teams said that they, clients ask about additional payments options daily. 61% said it's necessary or very necessary to offer multiple payment options to clients. 52% believe that more clients will ask about payment options due to the recession. And finally, 18% say more clients are already asking about payment options due to the recession. So if you haven't explored what your payment options might be, I have a couple of ideas coming up for you, but certainly you should think about that. Your clients, I feel, are going to be cash strapped and minimally, we should, have, we should revisit with our team what our policy is for extending payment plans to clients or at least how to uh, talk about these things delicately, because as you know, they can be fraught with a lot of tension, anger, and uh, recrimination if we don't do it correctly. I wanna talk about workflow and how we can change our workflow to decrease the amount of work that we're doing right now and also to, um, uh, to make us more competitive in the long term. So I'm going to run a poll for you right now. There are three questions in this poll. Please go ahead and respond to all three questions and then we'll um, resume the lecture in just a moment. I can't see your answers, so I'm hoping that you're popping those in there. We'll share the results in just a moment. Yeah, let's give everyone about 45 more seconds. 45? They don't need 45 more seconds. They're being slow. <laughs> yeah, well, they can pick it up. Hurry up. Julie, it looks like I've got one attendee who, I don't think they can see the questions. 
Hmm. The, uh, they should have automatically populated in front of you. Okay. Because I can see those, yeah. Do you want me to stop the poll now? Uh, yeah. Does it? So how, have, have the lion chair of them answer, responded? We've got about half answered. Well, can the other half hurry up, please? <laughs> All right, maybe they're driving. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the results. So uh, when the first question was, we're providing curbside care to our clients at this time. 67% said true. And it looks like 33% said we're offering curbside care, but allowing clients to come into the building for some services. That's consistent with what we've uh, uh, seen at other places. Uh, uh, cur uh, in other polls, curbside care has added a concerning level of work and stress for our team. 89% of you said that's true. 11% uh, said that's false. I think that's great. And I'm sorry, but I can't see the last result. So can you uh, 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 give me some help on your side, uh, uh, Suzanne? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, question three, we're currently planning to move care inside our practice in advance of cold weather. 22% said true. 44% uh, said false. And 33%, okay, uh, I haven't thought about upcoming Monday, let alone three months from now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that, so these results are consistent with what I'm seeing everywhere else. So I want to talk about workflow, but I'm going to start by talking about the workflow that I think is already unfolding at your practice work. Uh, you know, your uh, curbside care begins when clients roll into the parking lot. They probably roll into some sort of numbered parking spot, or maybe there's a colored cone. And then they call up the client care representative and they say, I'm here. That client care representative will mark that you as checked in in the software. And then she calls this technician and she lets you know that, lets that technician know that Mr. Hallow with Rye is here for the 10 o'clock appointment in parking slot two. And hopefully that tech remembers that. Because remember that now in the software, Mr. Hallow is marked as checked in and everybody, all of us in the building, believed that Mr. Hallow is being taken care of. The, the person that's charged with remembering or carrying that out is that technician. But if she doesn't remember, poor Mr. Hallow is left out in that car to burn up with rage that what are those people doing in that building? But hopefully that technician does remember and Mr. Hallow doesn't burn up with rage. And now she's going to go out to that car and she's going to get a history from Mr. Hallow. I hope that you guys have thought about the history if your technicians are taking histories with your uh, uh, clients. I used to love doing this as a technician. I unfortunately believe it's very inefficient. So I think in the absence of not really thinking this through, this is a big time waster. It's an area for you to trim some fat off of your, the length of time it's taking you to see patients and clients. But let's forget about that. She gets a great history. She brings the pet in. She sticks the pet in a room all by itself. And then she goes looking for a doctor. Hope she, she can find one. She uploads the doctor on the history. The doctor is or is not listening to that depending upon what that doctor's engaged in. And then the doctor goes in the room. It's been my experience that the doctor doesn't uh, talk to the client at this point because doctors are loving the fact that clients aren't at the exam room and that they don't have to talk to them. They're loving that. But at some point, she's going to do this exam and then she's going to get the client on the phone and she's going to let the client know what her assessment is for the patient. But because she doesn't want to talk to that client about money, she's going to pass the phone call to the technician who's going to go, the, go over the treatment plan with the client. And then she's going to do the diagnostics on the pet call the client one more time, give them an update on what's happening and pass them to the client care representative who will run a credit card. Then this technician is going to take this patient with the meds, with the discharge instructions, out to the car, drop the pet off, drop the uh, medications off, drop the pet off, and then maybe drop dead of exhaustion in the parking lot. That's been my experience with what you guys are going through. And it sounds like, you know, when you said that most of you agreed that you're having this critical level of, of, of exertion and, and burnout with uh, uh, curbside care, maybe this is what's happening at your practice. You can share with me uh, in the Q&A at the end of the program. So let's talk about some changes that I think will improve that efficiency. The first thing that I think that we can do is when the client rolls up, they're calling the CSR and the CSR can transmit to them through text message, or email, whatever you want, an electronic 
medical history form. So these things, again, are built on our WordPress website and they use something called conditional logic. That means that we can have one form fit all. The conditional logic means that depending upon how the client has responded to the previous question, the form will repopulate with other additional questions so that we can uh, so that we can tailor make it for whatever they're coming in for, whether it's a drop off, a recheck, a new client, a new patient, whatever uh, needs that they may have. So an example might be, let's say that we ask them whether or not the pet has been vomiting. If they respond, yes, that pet has been vomiting, then two more fields populate to ask them about the vomitus. When they're finished with this, they don't have to print this out at home or anything. When they're finished with it, all they have to do is click submit, and this drops into any inbox that you want it to at your practice. Please don't let it be a CSR's inbox. They have enough work as it is, so try to put it in a technician box or a doctor box because they're going to have to look at it. Once they review it, they can just copy paste, open up the medical history, and uh, uh, sorry, co copy it, and then uh, open up the medical history and copy paste and it'll plop right in that medical history. No formatting issues. This is how it looks in Cornerstone, and these are great. These can be sent to clients either when you are confirming their appointment, it can go out with the reminders, it can go out when they're rolling into the parking lot and give them something to do while they're waiting out there. Because remember, in the absence of not being able to see how hard you're working, they're out in that car thinking to themselves, what is taking them so long? So I think that this gives them something to, to do. We've had tremendous success with this form. We actually have an incredible high High compliance rate with people filling it out. I think it has a lot to do with the fact uh, that they don't have to um, actually print the dang thing out. And also it's mobile optimized. So depending upon whether they're looking at it, a tablet or a cell phone or a desktop, it will populate accordingly and, and size up to the screen. Another idea for you would be when the client rolls up, instead of contacting the client, the CSR and letting them know they're here, we have them reach out to a technician. So I could just feel you all like, no, no, that's a terrible idea. But listen to me, like them alerting the CSR that they're here is from before times. I mean, it made sense that we would let the CSR know that we're here because they were the only person in the building that saw you. But in the absence of her or any of us knowing, why do we have to go through her? It's just an extra or him. It's just an added step. So why not have that client text message this this technician and this technician can be working in one large area could be your lobby if you're not using it if you don't have a big tech uh, big uh, tech technician room or it could be your back treatment area if it's large enough and this person can be running a whole area where medical teams exist these these clients are rolling in and she is pairing up the right medical team with the right patient so this is great on all kinds of levels first of all right now isn't it sort of maddening? Because you've got, we're still putting people in rooms. I mean, not people, I mean, we're putting pets in rooms. We don't need to do that. It means three or four or five exam rooms that we've got to clean and stock and have all the issues that we've always had. It means that we don't know where people are because now there's four other places for people to hide or be stowed away in that we don't know where they are, which is, tip, which is an issue. And now if we're working in one large treatment area, where everybody is appropriately social distanced if that's if that's a problem and masked if that's an issue now we can see where everyone is and we know what resources are at hand we're all hearing the same dialogue we're not walking around with a single list of things that we have to remember all by ourselves now we're all chattering we're having a good time and we're working as a team and it feels fun another idea would be for when the client rolls up and lets the CSR or the technician know that they're here, let's go ahead and get a credit card swipe right now. Lots of practices are already doing it and it eliminates one more step in a very long process to manage people with curbside care. But an even better idea would be to get the technician a tablet that connects to the software. So the tablets that we use are provided by VitusVet. These are connected both to the Wi-Fi, but also can use the uh, telephone signal to get information. They're connected to the software. So if there is a, um, a, 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 a an outline of the treatment that we need to show them, a medical plan, an x-ray, it'll all pop up 
on that tablet. But we can also have them swipe their credit card right then and there, and we can take the payment outside. We don't have to run the credit card in, run the credit card back out again, or manage any of that issue. It can all be arranged through the tablet. We can have an ongoing text message dialogue with them if, they're, if we have enough of these tablets to just leave it with them out in the parking lot. And the good news is, is that no one is driven away with them yet. Um, uh, they also have the ability to connect with a third party called Split It. And Split It is, is an interesting service that I think that you should look into. Um, what it allows clients to do is take their regular credit card payment, if they have a credit card, it allows them to split that one payment up into many payments that that third party, that Split It, will manage. You don't have to manage it. They'll handle it on their end. Of course, it comes at a price to you, but um, it may be a solution that you want to have available for clients who are cash strapped moving forward. Oh, if you want um, uh, more information on any of these ideas that I suggested in this workflow, that's the QR code that will take you to a more expanded article on any of these workflow ideas. Um, I want to uh, talk briefly about a, a technology that I think is going to important going to be important that helps us moving forward. I know that it is hard to onboard this stuff and I know that it comes with bugs, but I can't emphasize enough how if we're already strapped for time and strapped for team members, we got to find a way to automate some of these things that we're doing that are taking our our practice team is draining our practice team of so much time and energy. So if you don't have apps or you don't have two-way texting in place, you need to jump on that. Two-way texting was instrumental in helping those phones at our practice to stop blowing up. If you're not using the two-way texting now, you know that those phones, you're probably hearing them in your sleep at night. They just won't stop. Two-way texting is great. So it doesn't mean that anybody's using your personal phone number. This is all generally generated through the app. Um, and you know, apps are a wonderful way for you to push out, push notifications uh, to clients so that they can read. And text messages and apps too are, have a real, uh, very successful look rate, open rate. They're highly uh, read, much better than emails. Uh, there's a lot of data that suggests that this has been a big change in people. I think, I wanna say something like 35% of people now have decided that they prefer texting to their friends. And something like 30% of people say they prefer video conferencing with friends. And all of that's happened since the pandemic. I think that it's great to think about phone management um, now. I, I, I never really liked the idea of phone trees. Now I think that they're kind of essential because our phone lines are blowing up. I would just ask that whoever does the, report, the recording of it is someone in house so that it still has a familiar, um, um, small business sound and it doesn't sound so clinical and automated. Uh, the online scheduling software that's about to hit the market is really great. There have been some kinks in the pipeline and some kinks on the software up to this point, but I know that these uh, software companies are working very hard on this. This won't be a schedule request. This will be opportunities for clients to reach right inside of our software through a third party um, and book their appointment. And lastly, I want to talk about telemedicine. I know you're all like, no, I don't talk about telemedicine, but I've got to talk about telemedicine. And I'm going, but before I do that, I'm going to ask you one more poll. So I want to do one more poll about telemedicine. And then I'm going to talk to you about why I think it's not just time, it's time has come, but we're almost beyond its time. It's such a, a, an essential, I think, service that we have to start thinking about. And I'll talk to you about how to deliver that. So the poll questions are up there uh, right now. And let's go ahead and start responding to those and we'll move on with the survey. I mean, the uh, seminar. Three, there are three questions in this as well. So please scroll down uh, to the bottom. Make sure you answer all three. How are we doing on the on the results so far? Got 75, 80% in. Oh, good. They like this poll better.
All right, we're ninety percent in. Shall I end the poll? Yeah, let's let's see what uh, people said. So as a human patient, I've had a telemedicine consultation with a doctor or other member of my healthcare team. 39% of you said true, um, and some of you said false, and some, another 6% said true, but you didn't like it. Don't worry, they're gonna get better at it. I believe that some of my pet owning clients have had a telemedicine experience for themselves in the past eight months. 67% um, of you agreed with that. I don't know, stop asking so many questions. 28% of you said that? I like these questions. And um, can you, uh, a CC on the CC side, can you read the last one because I can't see it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, question three, I believe that telemedicine on the human side will become more commonplace and that clients may soon wonder if the same service exists for pets. 94 of you percent, 94 percent of you said true, 6 percent said false, and zero said, um, let me think about it. <laughs> okay, great. All right. So I, you know, and again, that's consistent with what we're seeing at, uh, when I run this poll with uh, other audiences. So um, I, the, the, way this, the way that you're going to make this work is you're going to think about that individual at her house or his house. So we're not going to use telemedicine in lieu of what we're already doing. We're going to use telemedicine to get us out of the following pickles. We do, these, that person, for whatever reason, can't come to work. She either got she's sick with COVID or she's self-quarantining or she's afraid to come to work or maybe it doesn't have anything to do with COVID. Maybe she just wants to raise a family or doesn't and, and, and wants to stay at home or she can't get childcare and she has to stay at home. Or the other thing is, is that because of our staff shortages, we have restricted our brick and mortar hours. So we're going to try to use telemedicine to get around those two issues. We're going to try to employ this individual that otherwise is willing to work but can't for whatever reason come into our building or she's ready to work but when she can work we're not open so we're going to try to use telemedicine to solve those problems for us so when you think about it think about team members working from home or who can't commute you know all of you, I'm sure many of you, I would be surprised if 100% of you aren't looking for a licensed veterinary technician or a doctor. And that's some of you, I know this is true because I'm, I'm looking for some practices of ours. You've been looking for more than a year for these people. You can't get them to move to wherever city you're living in because they just don't want to move there or there's just a shortage of vets in that area. But remember with telemedicine, we can look anywhere in our state, anywhere in our state. I can just hear you like, but hello, what about the practice that will get to that point in just a little bit, but just hear me out, think about it. If we, is there a way, since I can't hire anybody locally, I can hire them remotely and um, we can employ them uh, and allow them to pick up some cases through telemedicine. What if we uh, decided to take histories with our with technicians or doctors who are working from home so i talked about those electronic forms that we sent out uh, right now at our practice we have two team members that can review those at home they can do that whenever they want to eight nine ten o'clock at night as long as they've been reviewed but because we're sending them out with our reminders and our confirmations as long as they're in at the inbox and they're available for them to look at they can review all that and that can be popped into the medical history with any appropriate messaging, uh, any notes that they need to. If they're, depending upon their schedule, they may even need to reach out to the client uh, before they come to the practice to clarify some uh, uh, items on, of how they responded on the survey. It makes, makes our day go so much more smoothly when we had oversight of an experienced team member looking at these history, popping in notes and reminding us of the big ticket items that we need to remember about this patient or talk to this uh, client about when we're serving them. Follow-ups and rechecks. If you would have asked me in the before times whether or not we should be text messaging, follow-ups or rechecks, I would have thought that was anathema. I thought that would have been the worst idea ever. That's a terrible service experience. You know what? We wanna talk to people on our text message. We've all undergone the sea change now of being comfortable with this. So just hear me out on this. We can set up the software to push out these follow-ups or additional questions about rechecks through our apps. 
This way, we definitely know it's gonna happen because once we work out the kinks in how the software is working and how this is flowing out of the practice, it will never not be done. So from the client's perspective, we really are crossing all of our T's and dotting all of our I's. And depending upon how you set it up, then if the client has an issue in the follow-up or in the recheck issue, they can just phone it in. Technicians could be leveraged as physician's assistants or even nurse practitioners. I can just hear you. I can just feel like the papers flying out of the screen, like, hello, no, yes, hear me out. You've only thought about it for two seconds. Just, just give it 24 hours. If you still hate me, then you can reach out to me with an email or a question. But just think about this for a little bit more because I'm telling you there's gold in Demdar Hills. This is a way that we can get around these chronic staff problems. Um, if, if we have licensed veterinary technicians who are working for home or for, who do have the time, not the ones that are spread thin, but do have time, there's no reason why they can't manage these rechecks through telemedicine, and you can figure out how you want to do that. And then, of course, in the end, have doctors review what they do. But this could uh, really streamline our schedule, get a lot of these people out. I also uh, you know, get a lot of these people out of the schedule and open it up for the work that we need to do for the more serious cases that we need to see. Um, uh, you know, uh, the, these kind of ideas are really very, very good for pulling off uh, the bulk, that, the, taking out some of that bulk off of the schedule and opening things up more for our practices. Makes, makes for uh, a much more efficient uh, uh, operations in the day to day. Can, we can use this for cancellations. So if clients are calling up the practice and they want to cancel, why? if we have the technician and the doctor, why can't we see the appointment as a telemedicine appointment right now? You're going to tell me that I don't get to do a physical exam. I'll be like, sure, but we can get a lot of the exam out of the way. All of that can go into the medical history. And now as uh, instead of them loading up the appointment book tomorrow, which is already booked as a regular appointment, they can be booked as a drop-off where we can do the diagnostics and then where a doctor can sort of run in, check the patient, and, um, and, and, and make sure that everything is cool. And then if you're really into building out whole new uh, silos, you know, once we get back on our feet again, think about the different kinds of cases that you can see at your practice. You may already be recommending twice a year visits for your senior patients. I would argue that your compliance for that is probably not all that hot. I don't know if you're measuring it, but in my experience when I measure it, it's not all that great. So why not now say, Mr. Hallow, her eyes looking great, but she's 12 years old, and I know these German short hair pointers. I'd like to schedule you a virtual visit uh, in six months from now. Because this is a service that you've never done before, there's no precedent for pricing. Mr. Hallow doesn't know how much it should cost. He doesn't presume it's going to cost as much or less or more than a physical exam. He's never had one before, so he doesn't know what to charge. And you can finally pick a, a pricing, uh, a fee schedule that makes sense for you and your practice. End of life, I think, should be checked in. I don't know whether or not you want to charge for it. I'll leave that up to you. But uh, end of life is a very hard, anxious, anxiety-filled experience for our clients. If there's a way that we can leverage our team members to reach out to these uh, clients and check in with the patient, um, I think that would be, I, I, I think that we would get loyalty and buy-in from that client for the rest of their life and every pet they ever uh, acquire after that. And also chronic conditions. I don't know how successful you are at getting your renal patients in, your diabetics, etc. No, we don't get an opportunity to do the diagnostics that you need to do or that physical exam. But if, you're not, if they're not being compliant at all right now, we're getting nothing in. And at least in this case, we get to check in with them, find out how they're doing, have, a, have a, an experienced medical professional on the phone, whether it's a licensed tech or a doctor, who's providing them advice based on what they see and making a stronger case for getting that patient in for diagnostics or a physical exam. And if they have issues with that because of COVID or age or what, then we'll figure out, as we always have, what to do for that patient and that client on a case-by-case -case basis. But I think that these are wonderful ideas, uh, wonderful considerations for you to help both improve the quality of service that you're offering and getting around some of these chronic issues that have always bedeviled us. And I want to talk um, uh, lastly about um, moving inside. You know, we're coming up to cold weather. There are, you know, lots of you have said uh, you're thinking about moving in. It, it's time that we come up with a plan. You know, um, there's two things that you probably, well, I'll, I'll tell you one thing is that OSHA, you're going you're gonna to be like, you're, I'm not doing that, Hal. As soon as I tell you this idea, you're going to be like, I'm not doing it. But I, I'm telling you, it's a great thing. OSHA 
has a free consultation process. So you can, and you can just Google that, OSHA's free consultation process for businesses. They are, I've spoken to their um, regional and national directors, and they are keyed in on the fact that, that veterinary practices in general don't have as much information on board as they should have out in terms of safety. And these people are not out to be punitive. They genuinely want to help our businesses be safer. I promise you, they do. They're not going to give you awful fines and come in and make you spend a lot of money. When they come in, they're going to give you cogent, level-headed, helpful advice on how to make your practice safer. And you know, when you do that, you really demonstrate to your team that you care. But the whole reason I, I, I bring this up is that OSHA now has been, because they've been doing this, they've been in pediatrician offices. They've been in regular doctor's offices and dentist's office. You know, the model for how you bring people into your medical facility and, and take care of them safely is already done. We don't have to think it out. They all, there's already a footprint for how, a blueprint for how to do this. So just reaching out to OSHA would be helpful. If you have ideas on your end about what I've seen practices do, I'm happy to sh uh, share that with you. But I do know of some practices that are starting to bring clients back in again. Um, and, and it's working for them and there've been no outbreaks. Um, but when you bring, when you decide to bring them in, and I think that you will, I hope that you do, because I, I, I think it's, I mean, it just seems there's just so many, there are just so many risks, I think, associated with sending our team members out into a parking lot in November, December, and January with ice, snow, and cold. I mean, that's coming with its own set of risks. I think that for our safety and our sanity, we have to figure out a safe way to take care of people inside. So when you do that, think about how, instead of it being a step back, in terms of safety, why don't you redo it as sort of like a grand reopening, a sort of rebooting of everything that you're doing? We talked about using this opportunity, not just as trying to figure out the band-aid to go back to normal, because there's not gonna be a back to normal, and there shouldn't be. Back to normal wasn't so hot to begin with. We should try to think about what a great workflow would be in our practice, map it out, and it can stay on forever. Right? It doesn't have to just end when COVID ends or the vaccine uh, comes out. I mean, think about, the, think about the steps that clients took to get through your practice. They walked in, they checked in on the desk, they sat down on the bench, they, the technician came out, they got them in, they brought them, put them in a room, the technician went and got the doctor, the came, doctor came back, they sat in the room for a little bit, then they took the patient in the back, the patient came back, the client had to go back out to the desk. They had a lot. I mean, there were so many steps in that process. If we were thinking about building a, uh, an isolation ward, or if we were thinking about the safest way to move clients through our practice to mitigate infection, we would reduce the number of steps that those clients had in, in their uh, trip through the practice. And if we did that, we could improve uh, efficiency tremendously. So use this as an opportunity to reopen your practice, to have a sort of grand reopening, the better service, the safer service, um, the, the more patient and client focused uh, uh, service. And if it provided that you have a meeting with your team before you begin this, this procedure, I think that they will all be on board. Um, so, you know, I, I want to leave you with these final thoughts. I genuinely believe that if we can just get ahead of this hamster wheel that we've been on, we really have an opportunity to be more competitive and to finally get rid of the chronic issues that have been bedeviling us for months, if not years. So try to use this opportunity. Reach out to me if you need to. Reach out to the people at Assisi Health for additional information and resources to get started. But I do think that this is doable. And I think that we have an opportunity to take this, this thing that we've gone through, as tragic as it has been, and emerge from it more resilient, stronger, and competitive. So thank you very much for your time today. There is my contact information. I've written an article on the five challenges of COVID. If you want to see what that is, you can just click on that link there. 